Thanks, Blake, and thank you all for being here. As Blake said, my name is Lewis Fisher, and I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about education reform. So New York City public schools have been in the news a lot over the past couple of months, mostly in response to new mayor Bill de Blasio's education reform agenda and um, his approach to charter schools. So this has created what some people are calling a Democrat versus Democrat battle over the future of charter schools in New York City. Um, this is particularly important because New York is often looked at as a bellwether for the national education reform movement, given that it's the largest public school system in the country. So Mr. de Blasio's policies have sort of split the Democrats into two wings on education. On the one hand, the de Blasio wing is marked by, like I mentioned, a sort of anti-charter school stance, in addition to a strong pro-union stance, a skepticism of test-based accountability, and an anti-corporate education reform approach in general. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that. Um, on the other side, you have the Governor Cuomo-led wing, also joined by Eva Moskowitz, the founder of Success Academy Charter Schools, and a former New York City Council woman. Their approach is marked by strong support of charter schools, in addition to a view of unions as sort of a special interest group, an emphasis on testing and accountability measures, and a positive attitude towards what I'm calling corporate education reform. So let me go into what I mean by corporate education reform. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the nitty gritty issues that go along with Charter schools, are they good, are they bad? Should we let them co-locate with public schools or not? Should they pay rent? Instead, I'm going to use this as an entry point to criticize corporate education reform in general. So by corporate reform, I mean the set of policies that propose to improve outcomes by introducing a market-based system to school administration. Some of those policies include eliminating or weakening seniority rights, closing schools deemed to be low performing, and replacing them by charters, increasing class size, sometimes by firing up to 5 to 10 percent of the teaching staff, and what I'm going to focus on today, increased test-based evaluation of students, teachers, and schools, coupled with what's called value-added incentive pay. So my argument is going to proceed as follows. Number one, corporate education reform, specifically this value-added incentive pay, is actually a morally distorting influence on our country's educational institutions. Number two, as social justice oriented individuals, this is going to have implications for the choices that we make and the tools that we choose to use in pursuing equity in American education. And then finally, I want to try to use this as an opportunity to cultivate a broader skepticism towards what some philosophers call a market triumphalism in our culture. This idea that market based approach should be the unifying ideological principle to how we organize all of our social resources. So the first part of the argument, market-based corporate reforms are morally problematic. When you have market-based incentives, it can have a morally distorting effect. So the corporate reformers in education assume that markets are inert. In other words, when you put a good or a service on the market it has, and it's exchanged, it has no effect on the value um, of that good. But as we're going to see, when you marketize certain goods or services, like great teaching, it can actually change its meaning fundamentally or alter its moral value. So to concretize that abstract statement, I want to use an example from a study on Israeli daycare. And just a heads up to the audience, um, I'm going to need a little bit of help. And given that we're here at the law school, I'm not above cold calling. So definitely <laughs> stay with me on this slide. I'm going to need a very easy question and need a volunteer. So, we had this study in an Israeli daycare center. They were struggling with parents occasionally coming late to pick up their children. And it was a big inconvenience to the people working at the daycare. They had to stay 15, 20 minutes late. So they came up with a solution. They decided they were going to fine the parents for showing up late. So here's where I'd like a volunteer. What would you predict, once they instituted that fine, what would you predict was the effect on the incidences of latenesses? Someone have a thought? What happened to latenesses when you introduce a fine? Yeah? They increased. They increased. Exactly right. 
<laughs> counterintuitive and paradoxical. They increased dramatically. And the reason is because the pre-existing moral norm against um, showing up late and inconveniencing someone was crowded out. People now saw it as a market good that they were willing to pay for or a market service. So this can be troubling when we see the implications on education. So first of all, when you incentivize teachers with money, it doesn't actually even necessarily improve student achievement outcomes. So one study in Nashville showed that there was no improvement in math performance despite bonuses of up to $15,000, which is a huge number when we think about the amount that an average teacher is paid. Second of all, there can actually be these perverse effects of such incentives. When you focus on money rewards, you can actually diminish the very effort you're trying to cultivate. Now, how could that be? Another paradox. You probably already know the answer over there. But, um, so how could this be? You take a teacher, for example. Mo most teachers, they're not entering this profession for the money. That's probably not surprising. They're entering it for other reasons. When I think back to my experience in Miami, one of the most well-loved and well-respected 30-year veterans there had left a lucrative six-figure job in the private sector earlier in his life because he wanted to teach. Now, when you introduce these sort of $500, $1,000 bonuses for good test scores, you can actually induce some of these good teachers to leave because you're priming them, you're reminding them of the fact that they're often undervalued in society and some would say underpaid. And the people that are left behind are the so-called bad teachers that we like, might actually hope would leave, but they don't have the other options. And finally, I want to tie back to the Israeli daycare study with some anecdotal evidence of my own. So when I was teaching, the school I taught at Booker T. Washington Senior High School, pictured um, in the lower right-hand corner there, when I was teaching, I saw the very um, effect that, when we, that an unadulterated market-based approach can have in undermining the teacher-student relationship. So some students, when they wanted to act out and they saw the school's culture shifting and the instructional approach shifting to prepare for these state tests, which are in Florida extremely, extremely important and tied to teacher bonuses, they did not hesitate to throw those government carrots right back in the teacher's face by saying things like, you don't really care about whether we learn or not, you care about your bonus. You're not here to necessarily teach us, you're here to get a check for our test scores. This can, you could see how this could be troubling. We see that the market-based approach can actually undermine the teacher-student relationship, changing it from the stern yet caring mentors many of us look back fondly upon from our childhood to having students view their teachers as self-interested, rational, profit-maximizing agents operating within a market system. The bottom line is this market-based reform system can degrade the teaching profession and crowd out its pre-existing moral value, just as we saw the pre-existing moral norm against lateness crowded out by the market in the Israeli daycare study. So it's easy to get up here and critique um, other people's creative reforms and say why you have a problem with them. I feel obligated to at least offer some more positive um, shifts in approach that I don't purport to be solutions, but can maybe help when you think about some of these problems. First of all, the importance of focusing on school culture. So there was an incentive program that actually did work in Texas, but the reasons why are interesting. It was not about the money. They offered students $100, $500, different amount bonuses at different schools for passing an AP test. And they saw that test results increase. What's interesting is that the students were not behaving as revenue maximizers. They were not operating according to the standard price effect that the market reformers would kind of predict, where the more money you offer, the better the test scores get. Um, instead, the incentives were valued for their expressive value not their monetary value. Their expressive value in the sense that they showed a positive orientation towards student achievement and emphasized its importance. And it had to be supplemented by other things in the school culture. Special lab equipment was provided. Special training was provided to the teachers. Organized weekend tutoring was provided. And the AP classes, importantly, were opened up to all students. 
giving them access to that prestige and that honor that goes along with a positive orientation towards student achievement in the school culture. Second of all, I think a sh the shift in approach should be marked by an elevation in the discourse. So what do I mean by that? Um, the education reform discourse today tends to focus in like a laser on these testing and accountability measures and these market-based reforms. I'm advocating that we broaden our, our approach and expand this discourse to encompass other issues that our society can address which can help with our educational inequity. For example, the segregation issue, as Dr. Pedro Noguera, an expert on race and education, has advocated. He says, we've been talking about reforming schools in New York and elsewhere, but this segregation issue is never addressed. When you concentrate the neediest kids together in under-resourced schools, they tend not to do very well. So a report just came out recently that New York City has, in addition to the largest, the most racially segregated school system in America. And the authors of that report suggest that maybe we can mitigate this segregation, as Pedro Noguera would like us to think about, through what's called unscreened school choice. So an example of that, um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and other civil rights groups have filed a federal civil rights complaint challenging the elite high school admissions process in New York City which is based exclusively on a test score. And some, as some of you might know, these test scores can have a racially disparate impact. Um, the SAT has been shown to have similar bias. So Stuyvesant High School, for example, 2012-2013, one of the gems of the New York City um, public school system, admitted 19 African Americans, 2%, and 32 Latino students, 3.3%. Again, based exclusively on a test-based um, admi admissions process. Finally, again, given that we're here at the law school, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about how this shift in approach um, could also be marked by a shift in our approach to educational equity litigation. So we'll take two cases as the paradigm, two recent cases. One, Vergara versus California. Um, groups in California have mounted a challenge in the um, in the state Supreme Court to teacher um, seniority rights and things like that, the sorts of process protections that the unions have won in their collective bargaining. On the other hand, Gannon versus the state of Texas, a recent successful state constitutional court challenge to the constitutionality of the school funding regime in Kansas. So the state Supreme Court in Kansas actually found that the the funding inequity between low-income and high-income school districts was so great as to be unconstitutional in Kansas. Um, I would advocate for the second approach. Again, taking a broader view of how we can achieve reform um, rather than focusing like a laser in on teacher accountability. So I want to leave you guys with one final thought. Um, this is a quote from Stan Karp, an English teacher, 30-year veteran, and also the leader of New Jersey's Education Law Center. He says, the market-based system would do for schooling what the market has done for healthcare, housing, and employment, produce fabulous profits and opportunities for a few, and unequal outcomes and access for the many. So based on what we've seen in terms of the morally distorting effect that these market-based reforms can have, on the education system, I would argue that we should be a little bit more skeptical and take pause before we allow market-based reforming to become the sole unifying ideological principle for how we distribute our social resources. Thank you.